I don't know how well is this showing up, Sin, everybody. This is the Hilton Head cane. It's modeled after the university cane. It has a beautiful silver head and an ebony body. We also have a case for it that was hand carved by Bill Barrett from the great class of 66. He's a just astounding woodworker. Um, so we're very happy today to award this to Don Dwight, who is the oldest member of the oldest class joining us. Sin, can you highlight him so he can uh, virtually receive his cane? There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi. It's a beautiful cane. That's very thoughtful of you. It is well, always, it, it's a fun thing we do in the club. And I've been on the Committee for Regional Affairs for the last year and a half. And I, I explained this, uh, this tradition to mm -hmm. the group. And some of them have decided to initiate their own cane. So oh, this good. is a great way to enjoy having the old guard present and to recognize the connection we have across the years, which is really special. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Okay. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about what we're here for, which is we are going to lift the veil. We're going to find out what the sommeliers know and talk about and what they practice when they do blind tasting and why they do it. First of all, if you haven't taken your wines out of the refrigerator, now is a good time to do it. And I suggest that you open the Pinot Noir and pour a glass of it so it has a little time to, to warm up and, and also open up. Um, Don and I, we pre-tasted these and we thought it did a little better that we could, um, we could really appreciate the aromas more when it had had a little time in the glass. Okay, so let's talk about blind tasting and why we do it. Why does anyone do it? Well, I think if we look at one of the most famous examples in modern time of blind tasting, it will help explain that. Who's heard of the Judgment of Paris? Anybody? 1776 to 1976 celebration. Um, in 1976, Stephen Spurrier, who was a British wine merchant operating in Paris, thought it would be kind of a fun and interesting event to offer some French wine critics who were distinguished and very knowledgeable an opportunity to compare some American Cabernet and Sauvignon, um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnays to some very famous French Burgundies and Bordeaux. And he was hoping he might just get a little attention and a little focus on these wines because he thought they were good and that people should be aware of them. Any of you who know the story know that the many judges who blind tasted these wines selected American wines as winners. One judge was incensed. She was so angry when she heard the results, she demanded her score sheet back. Um, and once the news became public, people lined up around the block in New York City where you could purchase these wines that beat the very expensive and trophy wines, the, the Burgundies and the Bordeaux, for about $8 a bottle. And the French decided that it really didn't matter because the American wines weren't made very well, so they wouldn't last unlike the staying power of these wonderful Cabernet Sauvignon blends and, and Chardonnays. But that didn't turn out to be the case. They repeated this tasting four times. The final one, they actually only tasted the red wines because they thought it was maybe a little too long um, to, to taste the white wines. But every time the American white wine and the American red wine continued to win, every time they were tasted head to head against the same wines from 1776. So this was basically the dawning of a new era for American wines. And Napa in particular really came on the map, particularly because of this tasting. Now, the reason this is relevant for blind tasting is that no one believed that the results would turn out the way they did. So one of the reasons that we all blind taste is to overcome our prejudices. We, we don't want to go into a wine tasting thinking we know what the good wine is. It's actually really useful to find out which ones have the staying power, have the flavors, have the aroma, have, have the substance to, to be the wines that we'd love to drink. And so this is a great wine to, way to find wines that we would like to drink. Um, it's also a great conversation starter. You can have a lot of fun 
over a glass of wine or over a meal, talking about what you taste in the wine, what you're enjoying, how it goes with your food. And when you do all of that, you have an opportunity to learn what you like about wine, which wines you might like to try more of. You might be surprised. You might think that you only like, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon, which has high tannins, high acidity. Um, but you might discover that you taste something with a different profile and say, well, I really liked that. So again, because you don't know, especially if you do a couple of varieties head to head. So we have a lot of fun to look forward to. And we are also going to work on teaching you how to develop the skill for blind tasting. And it's not a mystery. It requires practice and it requires information. So you know what you're looking for to help you figure out what the quality of the wine is and also to just focus and enjoy it more. So one of the things we're going to do is talk about some of the specific terms that wine professionals use and what are the categories they use to assess a wine. Many years ago, Don and I were in a, a nice restaurant in New York and the head sommelier had actually done a tasting of champagnes with um, a number of other sort of important sommeliers in New York. The results were published in the New York Times. And he said to us, oh, well, you just have to do a technical tasting when you have all these champagnes. So when he left the table, Don and I looked at each other and said, what's a technical tasting? We had no idea. Well, now because we've had a little education, we know that you want to focus on the structure of the wine, which is things like the alcohol level and the acidity level and the aromas and the flavors and the finish. So there are things, there are actually specific items that you look at that we're going to practice with tonight. The other thing you can do besides the practice we'll do with two wines, you can start building up your knowledge of wines and flavors. And one way to do that is to create a tasting kit. When Don and I were taking some wine and spirits education trust courses, we had a giant container in our kitchen that contained a lot of things that are pantry staples like cloves, for example, which is a smell that comes from oak treatment. Um, we also had a bottle of Ribena, which has the flavor and aroma of black currants. It comes from England. That's a classic Cabernet Sauvignon flavor. So you can look at the list of flavors and aromas that I've attached to this handout, and you can put together a tasting kit with fruits or vegetables or spices, and you can smell them and you can taste them. And then you can think about whether you're experiencing them in a glass of wine. They will be more subtle in the wine, but with practice, you'll notice them more and more. So let's actually turn to the tasting parameters page. Does everyone have the handout? I hope so. So I gave you a page that says Sommelier Secrets Wine Tasting Parameters. And this is the one that has a lot of the information about the structure of the wine and, and also some hints about how you make selections. For example, what's high acidity, what's high alcohol. So we're gonna to turn to this page in just a minute when we open um, our first glass of our first bottle and drink our first glass of wine. And we'll work our way through it um, to try to figure out what the structure is and what's going on with our wine. The next page after the tasting parameters is flavors and aromas. Now, there are a pretty standard set of flavors and aromas that people use and talk about when they're tasting wine. There's some variation. For example, critics may want to sound more original. So they may pick some terms that you've never heard before. Um, or if you've watched the Psalm movie, if anyone's ever seen that, and there's a point at which one of the, the master sommelier candidates says, oh, fresh cut garden hose. I guarantee you that no one has ever written that on an exam uh, for any certification, but it was entertaining and it's hard to forget about the movie. But generally speaking, the flavors and aromas that we're going to talk about are divided into three categories. Primary flavors and aromas, they come from the grape itself or they come from the alcoholic fermentation. So there are things you can do in fermentation that create particular flavors and aroma. Secondary aromas and flavors come from ways that the wine is treated. For example, if they're aged in oak, then there'll be flavors and aromas. Another thing that will happen is something called malolactic fermentation takes place, which happens in almost all red wines and on many whites. 
it converts the acid to a softer acid called malic acid, the crinza lactic acid. And that also ends up causing some flavors, um, kind of dairy flavors and, and bread flavors uh, that we'll talk about again when we taste the wine. Finally, there are tertiary flavors and aromas. These are the flavors and aromas that come as a wine ages. Now, not all wines will develop this. A lot of them are not suitable for aging, but for wines that are capable of aging, you can see development into a really exciting new phase where they bring out things like leather flavors or dried fruit, or in white wine, you might taste some cinnamon or some ginger. So these can all enhance your, your drinking pleasure in time. Okay, so having said all of that, why don't we turn to our Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc. That is the first of the two wines we suggested that you purchase. If you couldn't buy that one and you have another Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, that should be fine. Now, I picked this wine for a reason. It's really a prototypical Marlboro, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blancs actually come from four major regions around the world. They can be grown a lot of places, but they're and they but in those four major regions, they have very distinctive profiles. The wines from New Zealand often taste um, very green. You may taste grass in them. Uh, gooseberry is a green type of flavor. Passion fruit, if they're a little riper, is, is the riper version of gooseberry. So this wine offers you a really good window into what a Marlboro, New Zealand, uh, excuse me, Sauvignon Blanc is like. Now, I also suggested that you maybe buy some goat cheese. It's a terrific match. And virtually any of the Sauvignon Blancs you taste would be great with goat cheese. Uh, it's just the combination of the acidity in the Sauvignon Blanc and the tartness of the goat cheese. The flavors enhance each other and you'll probably like your wine more and your food more if you have those together. This is a wine, remember I said not all wines can age. This is a wine that's made to be drunk very young. The reason is that it's a terrific fruity wine. It expresses all the fruits and the flavors of the grape and the winemaking really well. And you want to enjoy that when it's at its peak, which is really within a year or two of, of when the wine is released. So we, we love it for what it is. It's very popular, but don't put it in your refrigerator or on a shelf and wait to drink it in a couple of years because you won't enjoy it as much. So why don't we all open the Sauvignon Blanc before we do that, does anyone have any questions so far? Anything we can answer? If you have a question, you could also type it in the chat. Don's going to monitor that and he will pass those along. Hi, Lisa. I had a question. Um, firstly, thank you for that so far. Uh, you mentioned the profile of uh, the Sauvignon Blanc and you mentioned New Zealand. So were those things particular to Sauvignon Blancs in New Zealand or in general? Uh, sorry, I just didn't catch that part. No, this is actually a classic New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And some people think it's because the um, ultraviolet ways reach more of the grapes and they and they bring out certain precursors in the grapes that result in the flavor profile. But if you were to take, for example, a um, Sauvignon Blanc from California, like the Mary Edwards Russian River Valley is a great one, that will taste a lot like tropical fruit. It will have a much softer profile. The acidity level probably won't be as high. So depending on where in the world these grapes are grown, particularly with this grape, it expresses itself differently. And some of the reason is because winemakers treat it differently, but a lot of it is that the climate and the growing conditions combine with certain winemaking techniques to, to make the wines distinctive. Um, so I have actually done a handout, which I think might be on my website, which describes the differences between Sauvignon Blancs from the four major areas. This one is great because it's readily available, it's reasonably priced, and it's also going to be, I think, very easy to taste and to find things in. So that's why we picked this. Any more questions? Okay. So get how about getting out your glass of Sauvignon Blanc? If you have a pen and something to write with, 
And then if you could also take a look at the um, the two sheets I gave you. So maybe pull them out if you printed it or else uh, take a look if it's on your iPad or something where we have flavors and aromas on one page and then on the other, which is actually about a page and a half, we have Sommelier Secrets wine tasting parameters. And we're gonna start working our way through some of these with this grape. And I'm gonna ask you all to tell me what you think. So now if you've got your Sauvignon Blanc, here's mine. Um, let's start with first, what we think the color of this wine is. Now, does everybody have the list which shows you the parameters? And the first question is about color and intensity of the color. So first of all, do you think this is pale? Is it medium or is it deep? What do you think? Everybody has their glass in front of them. Anybody want to make a suggestion? Maybe not. It seems pale to me. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, it's yeah. absolutely pale. No question about it being pale. <laughs> I, let me just get everybody on a grid so I can see everyone. And I would I would never disagree with Risa. Ever, uh, never. Well, the thing actually, what you're gonna find, because Don and I tasted these together, we just did it again a couple of days ago. We actually have slight disagreements on a couple of things. And and there will be kind of a, a window on some things. And even when you take an exam, sometimes it might be possible for something that's on the border to get credit for one answer or another. But generally speaking, I think pale is pretty obvious on this one. So so I agree with that. Um now. The next thing we want to take a look at is the color. If you take a look at your color choices uh, for white wines, does everybody see those? See where you're going to come. Yeah, it start, starts with lemon. You have lemon, gold, lemon. amber, and brown. Okay. Anyone want to make a suggestion for this color? Lemon. Yeah, I think lemon. I think, I think gold. Okay. So tell us why you think gold, and then we'll talk about that. Well, just a little bit deeper than lemon to me, and therefore with a little okay. bit of red resonance, but that's. So this is one of the reasons why it's good to do this in a group, Nancy, mm -hmm. because I, I don't disagree that it doesn't have some tints in it around the edges. But when we're thinking about wine colors, lemon is by far the most common color for white wines. I'm sorry I don't have a gold one to show you, but a gold one would be much deeper than this and the gold would permeate the whole thing. Um, this is the Wine and Spirits Education Trust vocabulary I'm using. If you were to look at the sort of the Court of Master Sommeliers list, they talk about hues in wine. So not only do you have to identify the color, but you have to put the hue in. So in that system, you could say this is a lemon wine with a golden hue. And there would be a point for each of those. Um, so part of, of doing this class together is to figure out what the system is we're working on. Okay. So pale is definitely a good choice for this one. And lemon is a good choice. Now, the next thing we're going to do, Maurice is writing that she thinks a Chardonnay would be considered a golden color. Yes, especially if it's been treated with some oak because oak darkens the color. I think I even put a note on on your handout that says that. But Chardonnays, un unless they've been treated, um, say grow matured only in steel, they probably will have some gold color. So the next thing I want everyone to do is get your glass, pick it up and hold it at your chin and give it a sniff. Okay, then hold it at your lip and then hold it at your nose. Ooh. So those are the three places you could taste the wine. Now, the next thing we're gonna do you could put your glass on the table in front of you. I don't think my camera is set up to really show you that, but put it on the table and give it a gentle swirl. This way you have less chance of spilling the wine if you're holding it on your on a surface. Okay, so now try it again. Can you smell it more when you swirl it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, now this one, it's pretty easy. Um, I'm holding it on my chin. I'm not having any trouble smelling this. What do other people think? Yeah, easy. Yeah. So we have some choices on the aroma. We have light, 
which is we can barely smell when our nose is stuck all the way in the glass, medium if it's at our lip, and pronounced if we can smell it strongly at the chin. What do you guys think? Hmm. I'm waiting for someone to pick one. <laughs> I, I think, think it's light. It's yeah. pronounced. For me, no. it's not pronounced medium. at all. Oh, interesting. Now, one thing is if it's a little cold, it takes longer, but it may also, there's bottle to bottle variation. I also so don't have a very sensitive nose. <laughs> no. So, and that's, that's an issue too. Um, some people are much better at smelling. Some people are better at tasting. I actually taste better than I smell. So I often have to go work backwards in the sense that when if I were taking an exam, when I wrote down the flavors, I would write them from taste and then I would go back and say, OK, did I really smell those or not? Um, so it's, that's part of it. Um, Don and I also tasted a bottle of this two nights ago, and we thought it was kind of a high medium. But the bottle we're opening tonight for me is pronounced. That's pretty common with these New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. It's one of the reason we pick them, because this has a lot of aroma. And I wanted you to start learning how to calibrate. So part of what we're trying to do is learn how our thoughts and the way that the wine tasters think can match up. And, and so we're gonna to try to calibrate ourselves to those things. Okay, so again, this could be medium, it could be pronounced depending on your bottle. Okay, now we're not gonna to try to, let's just try to do one run on the flavors and aromas. And what I'm gonna suggest is that rather than try to, to list them twice, let's all take a sip of our wine, move it around in our mouth, give it a um, you know, give it a swirl, put it in your mouth, kind of swish it around in your mouth a little so it really covers your tongue and the roof of your mouth. And then swallow it. You're allowed to swallow. <laughs> okay. So before we go into the long list of flavors, let me just ask a question. Can you think about how much your mouth is watering right now? And also keep, think, keep noticing whether you can still taste the wine. So let's go to mouth watering. Does your mouth taste dry with this wine? No, no. very moist. No. <laughs> Evidently not. Okay. <laughs> Are you really, are you salivating a lot? If you were to turn your head forward, would you start to feel like some saliva is collecting behind your lip? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is a fantastic example of a high acid wine. So we're gonna put this in our memory bank. <clears throat> high acid wine, we got a rush of saliva. We can lean our head forward and really feel like it's filling up the well behind, between our teeth and our lip. Uh, this is, again, a classic quality of a Sauvignon Blanc. So if you're tasting a wine and you're trying to guess what it is, and it doesn't have high acidity, it's probably not a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Again, part of this, when you start trying to guess what something is from blind tasting, you do a process of elimination by things you know. Who can still taste this wine? Can a lot of people still taste the wine? Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So if you look at the, the category here, what does it say? More than 15 seconds, right? So what does that tell us about the finish? Long. Yeah, it's long. a long finish. That's right. So again, the fact that this is about a 12 or $13 wine, that's a, that's a big plus. A long finish enhances your enjoyment of the wine. If you're having some food with it, the, the flavors have time to blend together. So that's a big plus, a long finish. Okay. Question? All right. Now we're going to talk about something that's a little trickier, and this is one where you really do learn from practice. How to determine the alcohol content. Now, when I taste a wine and I swallow it, the back of my tongue burns sort of proportionate to the amount of alcohol. Other people may have a different reaction, but I get a kind of a burning sensation in the back of my tongue. That's probably because my mouth is a little dry sometimes. But if it's really burning all the way across the back of my tongue, that's high alcohol for me. If I taste almost no burning, that's low and low is under 11%. And if it kind of burns a little and I can tell it's there, that's medium, which is between 11 and 13.9%. So 
why don't we try take another sip of this wine, maybe swallow it, and see how our mouth feels, any any kind of a burning or drying sensation. So Lisa, it's Charlie. Is it a violation of the honor code if I looked at the label? Absolutely not. That's part of the reason we're tasting now. <laughs> so look at the label and say Very to yourself, good. first of all, Charlie, you have it. Why don't you tell us what the what level it is? Okay, well, the label, uh, uh, set, now that I've confirmed that I, 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 won't, I won't get uh, filled out, is 13% by volume. Okay, and so you're all good Princeton students. What does that turn <laughs> into for alcohol level? Medium. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the way that your mouth feels right now, that's a medium alcohol hmm. sensation. What I do is um, after I swallow, I kind of breathe in over the, and see what I feel over the back of my tongue. And for me, there's kind of a little burn, but it's not really intense. Oh, Don just sent a note. Don says he feels the alcohol in his throat instead of tongue. So maybe you feel a burning sensation in your mm. throat. Anybody have any comments on whether they feel a burning sensation at all? Um, I, I guess I do. I'm going to put my video on. Um, uh, when I was hearing you talk about a burning sensation, I was thinking about how I experienced whiskey, scotch, mm -hmm. where the burn is really pronounced. Right. <laughs> so I was looking for, okay, what's a subtler version of that? Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to think, I think this is medium because it's not quite yeah. burning, but I taste that there's alcohol. So, so, so you already have a way to calibrate because you yeah. have something that you drink that has high alcohol. That's a great, uh, great idea. Okay. That's what you can all do. Try your whiskey, try your wine, make a comparison. Okay. okay. So, and then someone just asked if there is, are wines that are lower than 11% or cent alcohol. Perfect example of those German Rieslings, a cabinet, for example, might be only a seven or eight percent, six percent. Those are fabulous wines that you could actually buy inexpensively. You could buy Dr. L, for example. It's from a very famous producer in the Mosul, very reasonably priced. It's aromatic. It has classic qualities of a Riesling, and it's a good chance to try low alcohol wine um, that has very different flavors than what we're tasting tonight. So that's a good place to try. Um, okay, any more questions? Or should we move on to- Lisa, our... is that Riesling like a lot of the German ones more um, dry than um, some of the more domestic versions here? So there are different kinds of German Rieslings. This is a very complicated category of wines. <laughs> So when I think I mentioned that, I think is a cabinet. There are two different systems in Germany. One is where the wines are graded in a classification system according to the ripeness of the grapes. So the riper the grapes are, what happens to the alcohol level? What happens to the sugar in a riper grape? There's more of it. Yeah, I see a thumb going up. So the cabinet grapes are, are picked a little earlier or they're from sites that are a little cooler. But you can go up a whole ladder. But the cabinets, having said that, they're often made with some residual sugar, so they're off dry. So that's actually another opportunity to try an off dry wine, which we've mentioned here as well. Having said that, there's a different system where people are trying to produce dry wines. That's called the VDP system. And they make sure that their best wines are dry wines. It's very, very difficult to figure out the German wine labels. Not everybody does either of those systems. You can look for the word trocken on a German wine. That means dry. Um, sometimes people have started putting a little band on the back that will indicate the level of sweetness because you don't really know until you open the bottle. You could have one of the higher alcohol wines like a, a Spätlese, for example. And that you think, well, there's, there should be uh, you know, a little more alcohol in this, but if it's low alcohol and it's a Spett laser, it's probably off dry. Same thing with an Owl's laser, which is the next step up. So it's complicated. Those wines are delicious, by the way. Have have a one of these off dry German wines with something a little spicy, like if you like Thai food, for example, um, or ham. They're fabulous with ham or pork or sausage, um, and that little bit of sweetness works really well with the fat in those foods. So. 
Thank you. That's a really good explanation. Thanks so much, Lisa. And that was a long explanation, so we'll move on. <laughs> okay, uh, just so we love Rieslings here in this house, I'm a little bit uh, prejudiced about that. So let's think about what we. Is there anything we haven't done yet? Besides, I think we're ready for the flavors and the aromas in this wine. What do you think? Oh, we didn't talk about dryness. Sorry. Okay, taste any sugar in this wine? Anybody taste anything sugary or sweet in this wine? Yeah. We taste pretty sweet. We taste a lot of fruit in this wine, and that can be a little bit of a of a trick in a way. Whoops! Uh, it can fool you because if you if something tastes really fruity, that can make it taste. Um, you might think it's not dry, but this wine is actually dry. There's no significant residual sugar in it. Residual sugar is something that is in the wine if they don't ferment it to dryness, but this wine has been fermented to dryness. So put this in your memory bank that a fruity wine can is can be dry and probably is. Okay. Um, let's also talk now about the flavors. I'm going to go through, if you've got your sheet out there that lists the flavors of primary, secondary, tertiary. I'm just going to go through some and ask for votes, yes or no. Um, I'm going to skip floral because this particular one, I don't smell or taste anything floral. Some Sauvignon Blancs will taste floral or smell floral. But let's go with citrus. Look at your list of citrus. Grapefruit, lemon, lime, and nectarine. Anybody taste grapefruit in this wine? <laughs> I see at least one hand for grapefruit. I think, I think so. I see yeah. some yes, and I see some yeses in the chat. I There's think this, heart. this is a really pronounced grapefruit flavor. This is hard to miss in terms of the, the flavor of the grapefruit. Um, let's also move on now to stone fruit. There could be some peaches. What, anybody find any hint of a white peach or a yellow peach, for example, in this? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I can do peach. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, too. I think there's a white peach in this. Let's go back to the to citrus for a minute. What about lemon or lime? Anyone finding that? Lime. Yeah, more lemon than lime for me. OK, yeah. Now, one of the things you're going to find when you taste is that some you'll 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 recognize some flavors more easily than others. But it's great that people are recognizing flavors already. Um, I think there's lemon and lime in this, but the grapefruit is very strong. And there's some other flavors that are very strong. So we're back to this issue of subtlety. If you take a wine course and you have to do a tasting exam, they'll ask you to try to find five flavors and aromas. Um, so sometimes if you find lemon, you automatically write lime because you think it must be there. There must be a lime under there somewhere. Okay. So we've talked about the stone fruit. Tropical fruits. Take a look at your tropical fruit list. Middle. And you may not be as familiar with some of these. Mango. Okay. Mango. No. Sure. I think mango is a great mango. choice of this wine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else in here? Oh. Are people familiar with passion fruit? Oh, pineapple is a good one. I was going to say pineapple. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it tastes a little bit like a pina colada, doesn't it? Kind of. Okay. How about... Passion fruit, that's one of the classic mm. flavors of the Sauvignon Blanc. If it's not as ripe, it might be gooseberry, but it's it's the aroma that's probably closest to what some people call cat pea and Sauvignon Blanc. This, the really pungent aroma is either most likely to be gooseberry or passion fruit. I don't think anybody's gonna ask you to write anything about Pipi de Chat on, on your tests or when you talk to each other. Okay, okay. Um, Let's go down the list. Herbaceous. Remember, I said this is a classic flavor category for Sauvignon Blanc. Anybody tastes anything herbaceous? Let's take a look at our list here. We have green bell pepper, grass, tomato leaf, and asparagus. Maybe Excuse grass. me. Does this assume that we've eaten grass? Well, or that you know what it smells like in the spring. It you can do it sort of has a fresh grass aroma. I'm not a cow, but a little bit yeah. of grass. Yeah, I think it's very grassy, which mm -hmm. is again a classic. Okay. Now, Don is just 
Oh, hey, I just have a note. Laura is liking goat cheese with the wine. Will that affect the wine flavor? Yes and no. It will probably enhance some of the flavors for you. I'm actually thinking that as I'm, because I'm tasting all these flavors that yeah. we're all kind of detecting. But I, was I, I wouldn't. That's great. Yeah. The, the, in this case, the goat cheese should really improve your experience. Okay. Okay. So, so we've just talked about grass. Anything else that you think? Um, I, I don't think I taste, to be honest, I don't think I taste any asparagus or tomatoes or green bell peppers in this. But if you do, that's okay. Write it down. Okay. Um, the last category I'd like to look at here is fruit ripeness. Remember we talked in the beginning about whether the wine tastes sweet. How, what would you call the fruit, the character of the fruit here? We have a choice of unripe, ripe, dried, cooked. Any unripe. Unripe. I would say ripe. Yeah, I say ripe because it's kind of, it's very sweet to me. Hmm. I was going to say ripe too. Ripe and tart. Yeah. Ripe. yeah. I, it is tart, but I think it's ripe tart fruit. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. so, it's like um, it's like a. That's why I think it's passion fruit, not gooseberry. I think it, it and why it's mango. When you have flavors that are tropical flavors, like mango, for example, or pineapple, that's usually a sign of ripe grapes. You you find them very commonly in California white wines because of that. I mean, Chardonnay, for example, has a lot of personalities, but in a, in a warm climate, you get more tropical fruit. Fruit. So this is a ripe wine. Okay, mm -hmm. let's make the plunge to the secondary flavors. And let me explain what those come from. Remember, I talked about things that can affect the flavor in winemaking. Sometimes winemakers do something with white wines that are very similar to what happens when you're making champagne. We know when we ferment the grapes that we use yeast. After the yeast does its job, the yeast goes into a process called autolysis. It basically, it's not really alive anymore, but it's this nice collection in the vat called lees, L-E-E-S. And wines that rest on their lees develop, they can develop a wonderful kind of bread-like flavor and aroma. And there are different degrees of that. Anyone ever experienced that with champagne? I don't have taste, good experiences with champagne. Yeah, they taste something a little bready in a champagne. So mm -hmm. this is a much more subtle version of that because the, autolysis is a key component in champagne winemaking. Mm -hmm. But in our case, this wine rested on its leaves. So that means that we should be able to find here something in that cat yeast category, biscuit, pastry, bread. Um, this was not, as I said, it's not a champagne, which you'd feel taste very strongly. But the other thing that happens with lees, um, why does it have lees treatment? They get a very soft character and they coat your mouth. So take another sip of this, swallow, and think about whether you feel the wine coating your mouth and how soft or not sort of gentle and smooth it feels in your mouth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. After you swallow, do you still feel yeah, no, smooth? A, mm -hmm. And a coating on your tongue and on the roof of your mouth after you swallow it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's the Lee's expression. So that whenever you taste a wine that's doing that kind of soft and smooth to begin, but also coats your mouth after you swallow it. It coats it in a, in a like a, I don't want to say sticky, but like you could feel there's some, some depth to that coating. That, that's Lee's. So what would you pick out of, we have some choices here, biscuit, pastry, bread. I wouldn't go past probably those. I see a very smooth and broad coverage in the mouth. So what does anybody want to suggest? You can't go wrong with any of this, remember? Yeah. So I think it's more biscuit, biscuity or pastry. Hey, anybody yeah. else? I'd say biscuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one of those early ones, biscuit or pastry, that's a really good call for this. And again, this is a great example of a chance to start learning what Lee's treatment is like, because lots of other white wines will have this. Champagne, for I mean, Chardonnay, for example, is very common to have champagne rest on its leaves for, excuse me, Chardonnay rest on its leaves. Okay. So 
I think we've done a pretty good job of working our way through our um, our Sauvignon Blanc. We have a nice note from Christina in the chat, if all of you have seen it. She's got her goat cheese with a little honey, and she thinks it really complements the wine. That sounds delicious. Very so nice. if you have goat cheese and a little honey at home, try those together. Okay. Um, we also have a question from Greg asking if there's a metallic aftertaste to this wine. Um, I have not noticed that. Does anybody else have that experience? But remember that we all taste differently. Our taste buds are different. Some people, for example, taste bitter tastes really easily. Some people don't taste them at all. So just because everyone isn't tasting, it doesn't mean it isn't there. Okay. okay. So is everybody ready for the Han SLH Pinot Noir? Okay. Absolutely. Hopefully you poured this a little while ago because again, in our in our preparation for this, um, we thought it did better. Or your substitute. Yes, your substitute is fine. If you've got a any Pinot Noir will be good for this test. Um, we just won't be able to calibrate with you. But any Pinot Noir will be good. And if you've got one from sort of the central part of California, that should be pretty close. Um, again, depending on where it was grown. Yes. Yes. That's a quick question. So I, I used to live in Hong Kong and I love going down to New Zealand and the Marbo Sylvia Blancs were just so refreshing, accessible, particularly in Hong Kong, which is very hot and humid most of the year. But what is it about? Is it the, the aspect, the soil, the temperature that makes them sort of more approachable, fruity? I, I, the acidity, I'm just curious as to what distinguishes it from like Sauvignon Blancs in the new yeah. in the US and in, in France and other places? So it's a combination of factors. The climate is really important here. Uh, there's been some scientific work suggesting that the fact that the ozone layer is thinner there means that there are more UV rays and there's something in Sauvignon Blancs called thiols and they ripen more because of the UV rays and they're precursors to a lot of these distinctive flavors like the passion fruit, gooseberry, grass kind of flavors that are very distinctive to New Zealand. Um, so, so that's some of it. Having said that, New Zealand Sauvignon has been so successful around the world that other winemakers in other parts of the world, for example, the Loire, are attempting to, to recreate that effect. And they're trying to use other winemaking and growing techniques. For example, just the way they prune their grapes, trying to make sure that, that there's a lot more sun on the grapes because the Loire is not as warm or as sunny as New Zealand. So they starting with the grapes or the grape clone that they decide to grow all the way through the winemaking, they're trying to find ways to replicate those flavors. But I think that's that can be very difficult to do. I think that New Zealand is distinctive and it's one of the reasons they're, they're doing so well, selling those wines all the way around the world. That's but fascinating. I agree. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions about the Sauvignon Blanc before we start talking about the Pinot Noir? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why we picked this particular wine. Um, the Han family is in a lovely area in central California, and they have really been pioneers of creating some of these cool climate wines. Now, one of the things that's really great about this SLH line is that it's very reasonably priced, but that it's made to a really high standard. So it's, I mean, it's still considered a premium wine at about $23, but Pinot Noir can cost hundreds of dollars. And the other interesting thing about Pinot Noir is it can be very unreliable. You'll see wine professionals saying, my best and worst wine experiences are with Pinot Noir. You can pay a lot of money for Pinot Noir and it just won't really be what you were hoping for. So I really like this wine because I think it's made consistently well. If you like it, they have some more expensive ones, Doctor's Vineyard, Lone Oak, for example, Smith Vineyard, those are the three that are really outstanding. And again, you, you could, I think you have a good chance to rely on them to be good for all the money that you're paying for those wines, because they're probably more in the 50 to 60 or even $70 range. Um, the other thing is that the weather's more reliable in California than it is in other parts of the world. So Burgundy, for example, which is obviously the sort of the ancestral home of Pinot Noir, has so many 
weather variations from year to year, that that can really affect the grapes and the final wine in a way that's less likely in California, not impossible, but less so. So let's talk briefly about Pinot Noir. This is a grape that people think of as a lighter grape than Cabernet Sauvignon. It doesn't have the same level of tannin or acidity as a cab. Um, it's considered to be a little more delicate. That doesn't mean you won't get a really full-bodied wine, but, but it's a different kind of experience. Uh, major regions I've mentioned, Burgundy and France, California, and Oregon are probably key three regions. And you will find distinctive flavor profiles in each of them, even though, again, depending on the climate and the winemaking, they may have a lot in common. Okay. This wine, unlike our Sauvignon Blanc, is meant to go a little more distance. And the wine we're tasting tonight will actually have some maturity. So this is a wine you can probably drink um, maybe three to five years, maybe a little bit longer after the vintage. So you can put this one away for a little bit and you may enjoy it more. Although the 19, the one that I think most of us bought, um, that was the current release at the time that we purchased it. So they've already done some maturation for you. By the time it reaches the market, it has a lot of really, really um, promising and enjoyable maturation characteristics. Okay, why don't we try to go through this wine like we did with the Sauvignon Blanc. And let's start with the color and the intensity. Okay, so now we have, if you have a white piece of paper, if anybody has that, hold this glass at a 45 degree angle and look at it against the white piece of paper. And that's normally a very good way to look. We didn't need to do that as much with our Sauvignon Blanc. But part of the reason we're doing this is that red wine has more color and we want to try to determine, first of all, what the color is and then what the intensity is. So look at your color list. Anyone want to make a suggestion for the color? And you have a few notes on there about what makes something the color that I've put on the list. Seems medium to me. Well, that's the intensity. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking. Sorry, I'm thinking, I, 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 I would go ruby. Apologize. Ruby. Okay. What do other people yeah. think about ruby? Do you see any brown in this wine when you're holding it against your piece of white paper? No. We need some brown tinges for it to be garnet. Mm. Okay. So I think this is a, a great example of a ruby. And ruby is the most common color. So it's really good <laughs> to get a good look at a ruby wine. Now let's talk about the intensity. Let's take a look at our, our list of possibilities. Can we read? Have you got something that you could like you could pick up one of your sheets you know, from your tasting notes? Can you read the text through it? In the center, but not around the edges. Um, either way. I mean, the center will actually be the thickest. But if you just hold something behind it, that's written, that's written where you can read text. Can you read the text? Yes. Yeah. Everybody else, can you do that? Medium. I don't see medium. Okay, so why do you think it's medium? You think you can see the text, but you can't read it? Yes. Okay, so it may be that that's what's happening in your bottle. But this is the standard. First, if you can read the text through it, that makes it light. Mm -hmm. If you can see the text but not read it, it's medium. And if you cannot see the text, it's dark. It's pretty opaque. Okay, so if you had a Cabernet Sauvignon here, I'd be surprised if it wasn't dark. It could happen, but it's likely to be dark. But these wines, these Pinot Noirs are likely to be light or medium. Okay. Okay. So now we've done that. We've got the color, which is ruby. So we've seen the most common color. We have a good idea of what that looks like. Um, let's move on and let's think about intensity. Let's start with the intensity of aroma. What did we do before? We put the glass right here. We're trying to take a good smell. See what we smell. You can do that with your mouth open too to try to enhance your aroma. And the reason is because some of the wine from your mouth area actually goes up to your olfactory receptors. So put it at your chin. Okay, now try it at your lip. Okay, and finally your nose in the glass. Okay. Now, I would expect it to improve no matter what from your chin to your nose. Um, 
having said that, let's try our swirl test. Let's swirl our glass on the table so we try not to spill it. And let's do it again to see if the swirling changes our experience. Okay. Everybody have a chance to swirl and sniff? So what does anybody think about where you're, where you're picking up this aroma? Not where it's strongest, but where you can really pick it up. How about I, at the chin? I can pick it up at the chin, but it's stronger at the bottom of the lip, obviously. Sure. Okay. Mm. Ditto. And, Similar thoughts from other people. Mm -hmm. Here's why I think we're having a little trouble with this. I think this is a category that we don't have on our list. I think it's medium plus. It's a very <laughs> strong medium, which is why we could kind of smell it down here, but we don't feel like we have a good grip on it. When we get it here, now we're starting to notice, I think, some aromas that are nice wine aromas. So, so this is actually medium or um, pronounced would probably be okay for this, but it, it, it's tending more towards medium for me. It doesn't quite make it to pronounced. How does it compare to our Sauvignon Blanc? Could we smell that more easily or the same? More easily. More, yeah, more yeah. easily. And that's definitely pronounced. So by that standard, if we're only going medium and pronounced, this is a medium. Okay, now, why don't we move on and why don't we taste this? And we'll talk about flavor intensity when we taste it also. So we could give it a swirl first if we want to and have a drink and really swish it around in our mouths before we swallow. And then even take a breath in over it because we'll think about the alcohol. And make sure you get some up on your gums because that's a good place to sense tannins. Okay. How do you think the flavor aroma, the flavor intensity compares to the aroma intensity? Is it the same, less or more? I think it's more. <clears throat> yeah, I think the flavor is more than, <clears throat> the, than the smell. I agree with that. I was actually doing some research this afternoon because I was afraid someone would ask me why that happened. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think it, it has much more flavor than it has aroma. And the best answer I could find for us today is that we, we sense flavors and aromas differently, uh, that our tongue does a different kind of a job for us than our nose. Um, but I, we've had, I've had that experience lots of times. It often, sometimes it goes the other way. It smells great and then you don't taste much. So what would you, what would you call this one then? What, what category would you give it? pronounced i would yeah no, i think so too i i think this flavor is at least as intense it's different set of flavors but it, it's pronounced it may not be as intense as the gooseberry and grapefruit we just had but it is pronounced okay so how about sweetness is it dry does it have any detectable sugar that would make it off dry dry <laughs> yeah this is dry definitely dry <clears throat> what Definitely dry. Yeah, just remember that the fruit can kind of fool you. Okay, now let's do the acidity. You might have to take another drink at this point, and we'll think about the acidity and finish together here because we're going to time both of them. And if you remember, draw draw some air over your back of your mouth and into your throat to think about alcohol too. So is your mouth watering? No, a little bit, I think. Not really. Is it watering as much as it did with the Sauvignon Blanc? No. No. Nope. Okay, I agree with that. Having said that, the Sauvignon Blanc was very high. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this one is right between medium and high. Either answer would be fine. If it's a medium, it's a high medium. My mouth is still watering. How about anybody else's? No, stopped. Some people said yes, some people said no. So between a medium and a high on this one. So this was a little trickier. Um, Don, what did you get tonight? I would have said I was back to my non-category of medium plus because my mouth yeah, is... Medium plus. 
Can you hear him? I don't know if he's, he's yeah. saying, he thinks it's kind of medium plus two. So we're in our medium category. It's not like the Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Now, did everybody um, think about how long they could taste it? Can you still taste this wine? No. Not it's been a while though. It's yeah, been not as much seconds. Much. Not like the Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. But could you taste it after 15 seconds? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where does that put this for finish? Um, long the thing is um there's a wine that comes from austria that's called in german it's called unendly unending and the longer the finish i mean that that's considered a higher and higher quality wine the finish on the sauvignon blanc was very long but this has a nice durable finish it doesn't just vanish you, you can taste the wine for a while after you swallow it okay all right we're going to do something we didn't do last time. Did everybody get this up on their gums and around their cheeks? Because we're going to talk about tannins in this wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think about getting any like drying or burning sensation in your mouth from this one? No. Well, dry. Oh. Well, much more than the Sauvignon Blanc, but, but yeah. nothing like a, a bourbon or a whiskey, right? Well, that's okay. true, but that's not our comparison. Correct. <laughs> okay. It is dry. <laughs> Do, does anyone feel no drying in their mouth? No burning or no drying? I feel some drying. Okay. Yeah. Definitely yeah. drying. Yeah. So, drying on the roof. I feel high drying, but so we know there's we know this wine has some tannin, right? It is a red wine. It may not have as much tannin as a Cabernet Sauvignon, but but this one I think I, has a pretty reasonable amount of tannins. Yeah, I got some gum thing going on too. Mm. Okay. I find with the tannins, I have to wait a little while for it to develop. Like I don't feel it instantly. It takes a little time for it to dry out my tissue in my mouth. Um, so what do you guys think? Is it medium or high? I don't think it's low because we can all tell it's there. Mm -hmm. Medium. I would say medium plus for me. I, I think high, but that's just me. I, I think this is another one of those borderline wines. If we had our medium plus category, we would probably put it to good use tonight. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't want to put that. We don't want to try that yet. We're just trying to find the tannins and put them in a broad category. Um, this is not something that we're going to talk about too much at this level. But tannins can change in the way they feel. They can be rough. They can be soft. Any thought about whether this wine tastes kind of smooth or a little rough in your mouth? Tannin yeah. quality? Rough. No, it's not supposed to. No. You're not smooth. You smooth. I, think, yeah, smooth. I think smoother. Super smooth. I, yeah. I think this is a pretty white ripe wine, and and the tannins feel pretty soft to me. Mm -hmm. Rough tannins, you almost can feel them sticking to your mouth. Hmm. So that's something to think about when you taste red wines. Is that wine really going down smoothly, or is is the tannin a little rustic? Okay. Would you How see that roughness more in like a Cabernet or a Merlot, Lisa? You'll see it more in a wine that's that's pretty, maybe not as ripe, not as well made. Smooth tannins usually go with very ripe grapes, but also with careful winemaking. Okay, good, good call. Okay, so... How about the alcohol? Do we need to take one more sip and try to guess about this alcohol level? See if we can just start to calibrate ourselves a little. Sure. Remember to kind of breathe, swallow and breathe over it. How does it compare to the Sauvignon Blanc, which we know is medium? How does it feel in your mouth if you have a burning or a drying sensation in your throat or in the back of your tongue? The same? It's higher. Yeah, more. Yeah. yeah, it is higher. Yeah. Charlie, you're in charge of the bottle uh, of the bottle shock. What do you know about the the, the bottle shock? Says fourteen point five percent. Okay, this and is a whopping one point five percent more, and I'm floored. Okay, but you can tell the difference. Yeah, that is why I couldn't tell the difference because the wine I'm drinking is thirteen point five, and it tasted very similar. Okay, that's great. Okay. So you're getting calibrated for medium. That's perfect. Yeah, good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, yeah, so that we know this is a high alcohol wine. So the sensation you're having right now, that's the high alcohol sensation. So carry that forward with you in your memory bank. Here's someone who's drinking 14.1% and she doesn't feel a burn. How about um, some other sensation 
It doesn't have to be burning. Um, some kind of maybe drying sensation or a weight on your tongue. Can you identify? Because what you want to do is identify what it is about about the alcohol that you can <clears throat> identify and learn to kind of calibrate. It almost makes and my not. taste buds, um, you know, uh, percolate a little bit, whereas opposed to a you know, the other wine was like a bit syrupy. And so it was, it was thicker on my tongue. This makes each of my taste buds pop a little bit. Okay. I could see why. I think this is actually a really nice wine, especially for the price and especially given the fickle variety that we can't always rely on. Okay. Well, I think we worked our way through the structure. Oh, we weren't sure about the finish because we, we waited a little too long, but I think we decided it probably was more than 15 seconds. Is everybody comfortable with that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. So now I've got a question. Can the legs determine the alcohol content? This is very tricky, and I'll tell you why. Legs can come from a lot of things. For example, they can come from alcohol content, which is Greg's comment here, and I did tell you that if you see, if you don't see any legs, it's highly unlikely that it's a high alcohol wine. Having said that, legs can come from other aspects of what gives wine its body. So has anyone ever tasted a dessert wine? Does that feel kind of rich and thick when you taste it? They, those wines have a lot of residual sugar and they have a lot of body because of that. And they'll make legs that will just coat the side of your glass. Yes, port is incredibly thick. That's a good, great comment. So a wine like that, now port will have high alcohol too. I mean, port's going to be, you know, at least 20% alcohol because it's fortified. But if you think about something like um, a Sauterne, for example, that's a, a sweet wine from the Bordeaux area. It won't necessarily have a really high alcohol content, but it will have a lot of legs. So the legs are a little bit of a guide especially if you're drinking a dry wine, if you don't have to worry about whether residual sugar is complicating the story. Um, and if it don't have any legs, probably you don't have a high alcohol wine, like, unless you're looking at a different kind of wine. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the flavors and aromas? I just posted one. I, oh, I, I, what you I see it. Okay, legs, okay. Take your glass, hold it over your white piece of paper, put, put it at a 45 degree angle. Now, turn it upright. Do you see any wine coating the sides of the glass, hopefully the inside? Um, and you see it dribbling down. That's what are, that's, those are legs. Okay, thank you very much. I sure. If I turn the Sauvignon Blanc upright, I actually see a little bit of a coating on the Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably because of the body of the wine, the substance of the wine. So it is, it can be a little tricky, but it's still fun to know. Okay. So we ready to move on to the flavors. Let's start at the top of our list. Does anyone think there's a floral flavor in this wine or aroma? It could be flavor or aroma because you might smell something you don't taste. And if it's floral, what do you think it is? And remember, these are subtle. Very subtle. You can, if you want to do this again, swirl your wine on the table, put it right up to your nose. Another thing you can do if you're trying to find flavors and aromas, especially aromas, put your hand over your glass for maybe 15 or 20 seconds. That will concentrate the aromas a little more. But for most of yeah so you could either taste anybody if i don't get an answer soon i might give you one <laughs> i thought maybe i'm drinking a different wine than most of you because i mm -hmm. couldn't get that one i'm thinking maybe a little bit of rose maybe. yes that is a classic pinot noir floral aroma aha i see another vote for rose yeah th this has got remember it's very subtle but this has a little delicate rose aroma so when you smell this, you may smell a little bit of it. There are wines you can smell so a lot easier to find the rose in, but it, it's here. Okay, so let's move on. I don't think we need to talk about citrus, stone fruit, or tropical fruit in this wine. So let's look at red fruit. Red fruit is classic Pinot Noir. That's one of the ways you know you have a Pinot Noir. Okay, so 
Anyone want to suggest, look at your red fruit list. The red fruit. You have a lot of choices, red currant, cranberry, raspberry, strawberry, red cherry, and red plum. All right, I see a vote for cherry. Absolutely, great, great choice. It's definitely cherry in this wine. That's another really, that's the first one I wrote down on my sheet actually. Now, does it taste like a red fruit that maybe isn't quite as sweet? And if you look at this list of red fruit, which red fruits aren't quite as sweet maybe as a cherry? Um, red currant. Yeah, red currant is a good choice. Oh, and Sarah just said red plum. Absolutely. I think part of what makes it taste like plum to me is that it's very soft in your mouth. Like a plum is really a soft kind of a juicy fruit, isn't it? So yeah, definitely red plum. I would say cherry. Yeah, cherry for sure. Strawberry. There can be strawberry. It's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a vote here from Greg for cherry and cranberry due to the tartness. I agree. This is a little tart. Um, this is not like a, a really juicy red wine. It's a very, um, it's very flavorful and savory, but I think that um, cranberry is a good choice. Anything else on this list that you think is not quite as sweet? That you Remember, we're just practicing. You're going to get out your raspberries and your cranberries, and you're going to smell yeah. them, taste them, and then taste some wine and see what you yes. think. Okay. So I think there's raspberry in this too. Yep. So we've got a pretty good list. Red cherry, raspberry, red plum, and cranberry. What else did I just hear? I'm sorry. I'm not quite hearing that. Okay. Okay, let, let me say something else about cranberry while we have it here. Remember, I said that different Pinot Noir regions have different characteristics. Cranberry is really a hallmark of Oregon Pinot Noirs. That is a very cool climate up there most of the time. And they tend to, to see, and it may have be a combination of the soil, the winemaking and the climate, but cranberry is a hallmark of those wines. And if you get a wine that tastes like a little bit like tart cranberry juice, it's highly likely that it's from Oregon. Okay, so let's move on to black fruit. We did so well with red. What do you see on your black fruit list that you think might be in here as well? Which is less common in Pinot Noir, but this is a really nice savory complex wine. And some, so we want the same flavors, but is there the darker variation of them? I'm not as familiar with these, but maybe some black sure. cherry and mm -hmm. black, blackberry, maybe. I, for sure, there's black fruit in here. There's no question that there's yeah. black fruit. Um, I think black cherry, blackberry. How about a black plum? Yeah, plum. Yeah, for, yeah, it's that same soft feeling, but it's very, but it's very smooth. Whenever I taste plum, I always think, oh, that was so smooth tasting. <laughs> okay, let's try herbal flavors. Anybody taste any herbal flavors? Look at your list. Just, uh, what? Let's see. Mm -hmm. So the question is eucalyptus, mint. Um, oh. Anybody willing to hazard a guess on herbal? Dried herbs from Sarah. Yes, absolutely. I think for sure there's a little bit of a dried herb quality. You know, mm -hmm. think of like herbs de Provence a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I right. feel like that's part of the savory nature of this wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about fennel? The kind of a anise flavor. You know where I taste that? When I swallow the wine on the roof of my mouth, usually on the right side, that's where I tend to taste pungent spice. Um, and licorice and fennel would, would fall in that category. So swallow that and think about whether someplace on the roof of your mouth, do you taste something a little licorice-y? Those are all such unusual flavors to me. Mm -hmm. I would think that I would have to like try them and then taste yeah. them. So that's why Don had the biggest tasting kit on God's green earth. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was like this big <laughs> because he never ate licorice. He hated licorice. Yeah. So uh, so you're absolutely right. That that's that's part of the process. Okay. So let we've just talked about herbal and spice. I mean, either one, fennel or licorice, would be basically the same flavor for you. Let's get to our fruit ripeness. Is this fruit 
ripe? Yes. Has it dried a little? Because this is a developed wine now. This wine is a few years old. Um, what do you think? Mm. Dried. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, more I, dried. Yeah, I, I think we've gone past the really uber fresh stage on this one. Okay, now we're ready for the big excitement. We're going to talk about oak. Some wines are aged in oak, new barrels, old barrels, a combination of new barrels. Sometimes they just get a few staves put in there, but it affects the flavor. So see if we can get any baking spices or coffee out of here. What do you think? Mm. Again, you may have to practice with your tasting kit. Anybody want to make hazard a guess about whether there are any cloves or cedar? Coffee, coffee, I often feel on the back of my throat. So after I swallow, I feel kind of in the back of the roof of my mouth, maybe sometimes. But I, that's all individual according to your taste buds. Coffee. Coffee, yeah, I think it's yeah. very coffee. Anything mm -hmm. else? Maybe like dark chocolate around 70% or something like that. Yeah. That, that's my a, that's yeah. a very good oak flavor for sure. Mm -hmm. And again, you feel it for me, I feel it tastes chocolate and coffee kind of on the roof of my mouth in the back, but it depends on your, where your taste buds are. Okay. Um, I also think there's a little bit of cedar in here. Do you smell kind of something a little green? Yeah. See if you smell something like dark green in there. Okay. And can I talk about the barrel? Old, new, and now there are even. Okay. So mm -hmm. there are different kinds of oak. Many, many winemakers use French oak, although Slavonian oak is becoming more popular. And American oak is used less and less, despite the, even in this country. Having said that, the oak does not, when you mature, wine in an oak barrel, a couple of things happen. One is that they get just a little bit of oxygen, which helps them, their flavors develop and the wine matures a little. But the other thing that happens is they take on tannins and flavors from the oak itself. And the amount of new oak that's used affects how much, how much flavor of the oak and how much tannin is intensified. So in this case, the flavors we talked about, the cloves, the coffee, those really come from the oak. Those flavors aren't coming from grapes at all. And some winemakers, if it's a very robust grape, a grape that has a lot of flavor, they'll use all new oak, but that's gonna be like a Bordeaux, for example, or a very, very high-end Napa Cab. Because if the grape doesn't have a lot of intensity, the oak flavors would overwhelm it. So that's why some wines are, maybe there's 20% new oak or 30% new oak, or maybe, it's all oak that's been used once already. So the winemakers made the new oak wine, then they save the barrels and the next year or the year after that, even the third year, they put different wines in it, wines that were a little lighter, wines that, that to keep the wine flavors in balance would be better off with the oak that's been used already. Is that enough of an answer? Yeah. Okay, great. And that's why I said sometimes they even put staves in if you want to be really cheap, you throw in some pieces of oak. Um, you, you won't find that in a wine of this quality. Okay, let's go to tertiary. This is our first chance to try development flavors. Yes. Okay. So now these are flavors that come over time as the wine matures. This wine, again, for $23 wine, it has a terrific mature character. Um, take a look at the list. We've already said dried fruit up above, which is something that you get as a wine ages. What do you think about some of the other ones? I'll give you a hint that leather is tobacco? typically tobacco. I'm saying a little tobacco. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, not at all. And someone says leather. Christina, leather is usually the first development flavor that you find in a red wine. So leather is a good, if you're trying to find just one, leather is a great place to start. Okay. Anybody taste anything earthy in this? Earthy leaves, something that makes you think of the forest. I agree with Greg, leather can be wonderful in an aged wine. You, you'll notice one of our choices on here is meat. If you ever have an older Syrah, they get a, a kind of a bacony meat in a nice way, good bacon way, <laughs> but meaty kind of a character that adds a lot to the wine. 
Okay. Any other comments on the um, tertiary flavors? Okay. Well, we've done a fabulous job. We have marched through two wines. Bacon, the candy of meats. Yes. <laughs> okay. Candied bacon. <laughs> right. Can't um, go wrong with bacon. Yeah. So we, we've done a really good job. We, we've worked our way using examples through both the structure, the flavors, the aroma. I think you're in great shape to get some wines to practice with on your own. I just suggested the Dr. L to do a Riesling. Oh, boy, I have to answer that in one sec. Another thing, another wine that's very readily available, very reasonably priced, Kendall Jackson Vintners Reserve Chardonnay. It's got oak treatment. It's got malolactic. It's bursting with flavor. It's easy to smell and taste. It doesn't cost very much. You can buy more than one bottle and try it more than once. Um, so that's a, a that would be another great one to try next. I just had a question on our favorite Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, you know, Don and I have not had a lot of luck with those, to be honest. They had a couple of warm years, like 2017, <clears throat> where we really liked them more. And that was because they were a little riper, but we're not big fans of the cranberry. Don, you want to unmute and make a suggestion on an Oregon Pinot Noir? We've had some that we really liked. They're very expensive. They're really expensive. I, I think Christina's suggestion of Domaine Duran is a good one. Oh, That's yeah. a, a really well-known uh, mm -hmm. producer family that goes back, you know, for a long time in Burgundy. And they spotted uh, Oregon mm. as a place where they could make the wines. In fact, if you we visited uh, in Burgundy and, and you can see they have like they brought big chunks of the of the of the soil from o Oregon and they have chunks of the soil from Burgundy. And they'll show you what they're how they're alike and how they're different. So so uh, I think that that Domaine Joanne is, is a great choice. Bergstrom's a great, yeah. a great one as well. I think, you know, everybody's got wines they like and they don't like. And, and for whatever reason, um, despite growing up near the cranberry bogs at southern New Jersey, I've never been a cranberry fan. So I tend to lean towards the, the Pinot Noirs that are a little bit less cranberry. You know, that's a good, we ha, we've had some wonderful Druans though. We really enjoyed them. That, I should have thought of that sooner. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions? What are we doing with questions? And Christina has found for you uh, on Total Wine, the Dr. L. That should be readily available, very, very reasonably priced all around. Um, there's a Washington Riesling um, by Chateau Saint-Michel called Eroica, E-R-O-I-C-A. If you don't find the Dr. L, um, that again would be a good one to practice on. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, it's time to move to, um, to just wrapping up. And I can't do that. Well, without thanking everyone who has been involved in this, first of all, we've had so many clubs here. We have the Princeton Club of New York. We have the Princeton Club of New England. We have the Princeton Association of Northern California. We're very happy to have St. Louis here and also the APGA. So thank you for all of that. Thank you for joining together. It's been so great that we could do this together. Uh, and I also like to thank the CORA leadership because they have really encouraged us to think about cross club events. And I think it's a lot of fun for us to do these and to get to know each other this way. Um, I'd also like to thank Christina Clark. Did you all like the tiger on the cover of your handout, the sommelier tiger? Yes. Oh, Christina <laughs> created that for us. It's beautiful. Yeah. And then nice. Cindy Drakeman, who has been here, administering this for us and making sure that we could all be here and be recorded. She designed our beautiful handout, our absolutely gorgeous handout, um, and makes it so user-friendly and so um, easy to, to work through. Having said that, I don't know if any of you saw the recent news from the university about the postcard project for the Princetoniana group. Did anybody see that? Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, Cindy designed those postcards. So we're seeing her designs all around us. And at, this is despite, as someone says, happy baby. She is the new mother of five-month-old Eleanor, our tiger cub. 
Uh, so she has managed to make these incredible design projects succeed uh, because she's very talented and she she gave of herself to do that. So many thanks. Okay, And let me just thank all of you for joining in tonight. It was so much fun. It was great to see everyone. And if anyone wants to stay on and chat, you're welcome to do that. But the program has concluded. But we're happy to answer questions or answer questions about things like the wine certification programs. What are the different ones? How do they work? Anything that you'd like. Thank you so much, Lisa. This Thank was you. amazing. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining.